Hello friends! So, the big exciting Canadian election is finally over, and spoiler alert, Justin Trudeau won. Yes, Prime Minister Trudeau proved himself to be something of a comeback kid on Monday night, beating back expectation that he had been too weakened by scandal and embarrassment to hang on. Instead, he was re-elected to a solid second term. Well, maybe not quite so solid. Trudeau lost the popular vote, making him the first prime minister in 40 years to do so. He also won the smallest share of the popular vote of any prime minister in Canadian history, so that's not great. But more significantly, Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party also lost its majority status in the Canadian Parliament. This means that Justin Trudeau now heads what we in Canada call a minority government, which is when the Prime Minister is a visible minority. No, I'm just kidding. A minority government is actually a somewhat misleading term that describes the situation in which the Prime Minister does not control a majority of seats in the Parliament. Obviously, he doesn't control a minority of seats, otherwise he wouldn't be Prime Minister. He still controls the largest number of them, but all of the other parties control more seats if you smush them all together. This means that if Trudeau wants to get anything done over the course of the next four years, he will have to rely on the votes of his political enemies to pass his legislation. And how did his political enemies do? Well, well, let's take a look. The Conservative Party came in a solid second. The Conservative leader, Andrew Scheer, said it was in fact the best ever second place showing in Canadian history, which I don't think is true, but you know, he did win the popular vote. The Bloc Québécois, the French-Canadian separatist party, meanwhile came in third. This was a pretty dramatic upset given that only eight years ago people had written off the Bloc Québécois party as completely dead given its poor showing in the 2011 election. Quebecers are finally done with separatism, is what all of the media people said. And then Yves-Francois Blanchet is like, hold my poutine. In fourth place was the New Democratic Party of our old pal Jagmeet Singh. And honestly, I have no idea if this was a good or bad showing for him. Expectations for Singh have been completely all over the place over the last two years, so it's kind of unclear exactly what standard we're supposed to be using to measure him at this point. He didn't have a fantastic showing, but it also wasn't as bad as it could have been. So I guess he neither wound up being a superstar or a flop, but rather just a relatively average NDP leader. Now, Prime Minister Trudeau is in a relatively strong position in relation to the other parties in that he only needs the votes of one of them to get his stuff through the parliament. Trudeau has said he plans to work with the other parties on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, the Conservatives might support him on something, while the NDP might support him on something else. This makes sense because in Canada we don't really play this game of making formal multi-party coalitions the way that they do in, like, Italy or Israel. But the downside of not having a formal coalition is that the parliament, at any time could theoretically do the dreaded vote of no confidence. That's when all the other parties gang up together and vote to hold an emergency election, thereby cutting the Prime Minister's term short. Now is that likely to happen anytime soon? I doubt it. Losing an election is a humbling experience, and I don't think that the other parties are gunning for a do-over anytime soon. The conventional wisdom on minority government situations is that it usually takes about two years for the opposition parties to get their affairs in order, and only then will they pull the trigger and send things back to the voters. Alright, now it is time to do some political analysis. What can we conclude about these election results? What do they mean? Well, one of the big themes that all of the pundits are talking about is regionalism. As we can see from looking at this map of all of the parliamentary seats, Canadians tend to vote quite differently from one another based on where they live. The Westerners all vote conservative, Ontarians and folks on the East Coast vote liberal, and the Quebecers are obviously the only people who vote for the Bloc. And of course, we here in British Columbia are so open-minded that we support all of the parties. Of course, this sort of regional breakdown is really nothing new. In fact, if I was trying to teach someone about Canadian politics and wanted to draw a map showing all of the provinces voting in the most stereotypical way, it would probably look like this. But the reason people are giving for why we all voted quite so stereotypically this time around has a lot to do with some of the issues that were raised in this campaign, and the degree that these issues played to voters' stereotypical regional interests, which are all generally quite incompatible with one another. For example, Prime Minister Trudeau ran hard as the climate change candidate, the guy who was in favor of carbon taxes and tighter regulations on the oil and gas industry. This in turn was seen as 
is a huge affront to the oil and gas producing parts of Canada, who rallied hard behind the Conservative Party, who promised to be their champion. In fact, the reason why the Conservative Party won the popular vote despite losing the seat count is because the party has just become so popular in Western Canada. As my friend put it, they are winning their seats by Saddam Hussein style margins. But these are in the end essentially wasted votes. Meanwhile, all of the English Canadian parties opposed the Quebec government's recent so-called secularism bill, which bans people from government jobs if they dress in an ostentatiously religious way. This, in turn, supposedly drove a lot of French Canadian voters to the Bloc Québécois, the only party that was willing to stand up for the ban. And then the NDP won a couple of seats in like super hardcore downtown areas or university towns, yada yada. They also lost all but one of their seats in Quebec. This, of course, has nothing to do with racism. It is strictly a coincidence that the province that recently passed a ban on public service workers from wearing turbans also massively voted against the first prime ministerial candidate to wear a turban. Anyway, the conclusion to reach here is that the Liberal Party clearly has the strongest regional coalition in Canada. This is largely because because they have such a firm grip on the hearts and minds of the voters of Ontario, Canada's biggest province, as well as about half of Quebecers and lots of little sprinklings elsewhere. And why does Ontario love the Liberals so much? Why was Ontario the only province that voted less conservative this time around? Well, one of the standard narratives is that Ontarians have been turned off the Conservative Party thanks to the incompetent government of their province's Conservative Premier, Doug Ford. So even though Justin Trudeau's approval rating is quite low in Ontario, Doug Ford's is even worse. There is an old cliche in Canadian politics that Ontarians always regret who they voted for in their most recent provincial election, so they vote for the opposite party in the next federal election. So I guess Andrew Scheer was just on the wrong end of this particular trend. But you know, there's also a thinking that I am quite partial to, that says that the Conservative Party just doesn't really have a lot of compelling ideas these days. Andrew Scheer ran a very contrarian campaign that tried to exploit the irritation that a lot of Canadians have for the hypocrisy and general obnoxiousness of Justin Trudeau. Mr. Trudeau, you are a phony and you are a fraud and you do not deserve to govern this country. But he didn't really offer a clear sense of what the Conservatives would do differently. The Conservatives were happy to be known as the defenders of the Canadian oil industry and they offered some modest tax relief, but it was never super clear really what they stood for beyond that. I mean, in contrast, you can easily say that the Liberals are the party of bold action on climate change, which they clearly take very seriously. They're also the party of gun control, higher immigration, abortion rights, the LGBT movement, and greater compassion for the Aboriginal Canadians. You can debate whether or not these are good or bad causes, but there's no denying that they are things that the Liberal Party is very proud to support and happy to talk about. So yeah, figuring out how to be a compelling, confident conservative is gonna be a challenge for the party over the next little while. And will Andrew Scheer be the man to lead them through it? Or is he going to be forced to step down by the angry base of his party who are furious he couldn't beat Trudeau? For now, Scheer says he is willing to hang on and is looking forward to fighting a rematch with Trudeau at the next election. But Scheer will also face a vote of confidence at the Conservative Party convention in a couple of months. So we'll have to see how that goes. The last party leader to lose an election and then go before the party membership asking for a second chance was the NDP's Thomas Mulcair in 2016. Didn't work out so well for him. And what of the minor parties? So I am sad to say that my most hated party, the Greens, had their best ever showing in this election. Of course, since we are talking about the Greens here, by best ever, I mean they won three measly seats. They held the two they already had on Vancouver Island and won a third in New Brunswick in what was perhaps one of the few genuine surprises of the evening. Prime Minister Trudeau's former Attorney General, Jody Wilson-Raybould, who was kicked out of the Liberal Party amid much scandal earlier this year, was also re-elected as an independent member of parliament. This is a very unusual thing to happen in Canadian politics, and I didn't think she'd be able to pull it off. These people are not really relevant as anything more than historic trivia, however. Their numbers are just too small to be any sort of relevant voting bloc, even in a minority government situation. But they can at least take pride in the fact that they still did better than Maxime Bernier. Yes, Maxime Bernier, head of the People's Party, the party that all the people on 4chan were like, oh, don't believe the polls, they're gonna make a huge breakthrough, it's gonna be a big phenomenon, it's gonna change everything. Yeah, they won 
1% of the vote. Maxime Bernier himself wound up losing his own parliamentary seat, defeated by a conservative, so I guess that's the end of him. There was a kind of late in the campaign scandal in which it was revealed that the Conservative Party had invested a lot of time and money in trying to seek and destroy the People's Party, which in retrospect, looks like complete overkill. The People's Party wasn't even that relevant as a vote splitter. Assuming 100% of People's Party voters would have voted Conservative under normal circumstances, we can say that there were maybe like six or seven seats that they cost the Conservative Party due to them playing a spoiler in really tight races. One of these, incidentally, was the riding of my friend Nicholas who you might remember from an earlier video. Nick lost this district to the Liberal Party candidate by a margin of only 339 votes, while the People's Party candidate won 687. My other candidate friend, Michael, who you may also remember from the earlier video, as well as the election night live stream, also went down to defeat. Although this was a much larger defeat and a lot less unexpected. Michael came in fourth place in his Montreal riding, behind the Liberal incumbent and the NDP and Bloc Quebecois candidates. And what of our beloved fringe parties? Well, they all did quite bad, even by fringe standards. The Libertarian Party did horribly, dropping almost 28,000 votes to a mere 8,000. The Marxist-Leninist Party plummeted to only 4,000 votes, their worst slump in years. The Rhino Party did a little bit better than usual, winning nine and a half thousand votes. A thousand of those going to the fake Maxime Bernier, who ran against the real one. This did not affect anything. The only fringe party that did relatively well was the Christian Heritage Party, which gained about 3,000 votes and thus ended 15 years of pretty steady decline. I should also note that a few new fringe parties burst onto the scene and were relatively competitive with the fringe establishment. The Animal Protection Party, for instance, won 4,000 votes, which was better than the communists. Something called the Quebec Independence Party, which is apparently a hardcore breakaway faction of the Bloc Quebecois, got close to 4,000 votes as well. But the breakout star was the Veterans Coalition Party of Canada. It got 6,000 votes, jumping from zero to fourth place in the fringe Olympics in just one election. Canada has about 600,000 veterans, so I guess they captured about 1% of their demographic. So that was the 2019 Canadian general election. Hopefully you've enjoyed these last two months of non-stop election coverage. Hopefully I've deepened your understanding of Canadian politics at least a little bit. Personally, I've gotten a bit sick of Canadian politics, so I think I'm gonna take a break from this topic for a while. Please let me know in the comments if you have any other ideas you'd like to see me tackle. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like, click that little bell buddy, and don't forget, to subscribe. I will see you all next week.